Welcome, everyone. Um, today, we are happy to host a, a very special guest uh, on our podcast. It's actually also the very first podcast that we are producing in the English. And we have today uh, Jonathan Younger, that I might call the guru of freelance revolution worldwide. Hi, John. Hi, how are you, Hesper? And hi, Gregor. It's a pleasure to join you guys. And it's a pleasure to be on the Redigate podcast. This is great. Thank you, John. Pleasure for us. Thank you, John. Thank you. John, as you as you notice, I introduced you as a as a guru of the freelance revolution yes. worldwide. Uh, <laughs> why am I allowed to do so? <laughs> Well, Gregory and I will probably explain that that um, the guru is another term for old guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an old guy. I, uh, I, I I have been interested in freelancing for quite a number of years. I've been writing about it since uh, 2013, uh, since its uh, early days, if I may put it that way. And uh, I, I I truly respect this this new dimension of the future of work. It's a very exciting thing to see not only millions, but literally tens and hundreds of millions of people creating their own future as solopreneurs uh, and discovering that where you're born is no longer the critical factor in what you become. That's a very powerful thing. You know, my my relatives moved from Poland and Romania to the United States at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. My ancestors came uh, to make what was for them at that moment a better life. For the, for the people living in Poland now, they don't need to move to the United States to make a better life. They can work anywhere in the world and to make a better life for their families while in Poland. This is an amazing thing brought about by a combination of technology, uh, the realities of the new workplace, and the interests of individuals of varying ages like yourselves and, and myself. It's a very interesting time to be alive and to be working. During your career, you, you work at plenty organizations focusing on developing talent, finding talents, growing talents, and so on. Um, so you might also have a, a very good um, a very good overview about the trends, how the trends have changed over the years when it comes to the uh, HR management, when it comes to talent management, when, when it comes to collaborating with the external uh, resources. Where do you see the roots of the of the free, free revolution, where it comes from? It's a it's a wonderful question, and it comes from a very obvious banal place, and that is that. Companies can't afford to have all of the resources that they need. At the end of the day, so much is changing. The speed of change is so great that companies can't keep up in traditional hiring. You know, I used to work a million years ago uh, for, for a very, very fine company, Exxon Corporation, Exxon Mobil. Although when I joined, it was just Exxon. It had not brought together with Mobil yet. And in fact, I was part of the activity that brought Mobile and Exxon together. And what, what I remember from my Exxon days, and it was such an interesting statement, Exxon would say, if something is worth doing, then we should own the expertise. If something is worth doing, we should own the expertise. Well, Exxon can't say that anymore. And mm -hmm. it can't say that anymore for two reasons. One is because it, it can't afford, even as large and important as it is, to own all the expertise that it relies on. And second, not all of the not all of the people that have that expertise want to work full time for Exxon. And so we're in a situation where Exxon needs a variety and lots of other organizations need a variety of skills that they may not own. They may not have within their local area. They might not even have within the country. I mean, what we know right now is how many chat GPT people are likely to be in Hungary at the moment. But what we know is that the nation of Hungary is going to need lots of them. Mm -hmm. So we need another way to do that. And what's made possible through technology is, of course, the idea of people working remotely in places like Poland or in New York, but serving organizations in a different place. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what has made it possible. You know, the other thing is that... And I always liked this statement that was made. I can't remember quite who said it, but what they said was, 
that the power of a Redigate, the power of an organization like yours, a platform for specialists, for experts in a variety of fields, you know, the, the power of that is that your clients are able to discover talent that they didn't know existed, that they couldn't reach through any other way. So you have you have made magic for these guys by making it possible for them to have access to expertise that they could not find on their own. That's amazing. That's another of the reasons. So there are so many dimensions of this between technology, between the future of work that individuals are interested in, through the implications of what people want to be doing. We are we are in a very interesting time, Casper, and I'm very excited. Uh, about the implications of that, not only for platforms like yours, but for companies all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the when it comes to the market overview, I mean, you've been you've been covering the the topic of, of freelancing of the expert freelancing for a for a while already for Forbes uh, US. Um, you yes. might have a very good, a very good, a very good insight into the way the the platforms develop also worldwide. Uh, which markets or what markets are now the, the strongest ones and where do you see the, the, the top developments at the moment? You know, what an interesting question that is. So so let me let me let me sort of take you around the world very quickly and please excuse me for for uh, some of the things that I won't capture. Um, if you look at the US, the US is very strong in uh, in in two key areas. One key area is technology, of course. The US is a very strong foundation for freelancing across technologies, everything from DevOps to, to on the other hand, AI. Uh, we know that it's also very, very strong in the area of creatives and marketing services. It's interestingly, it's not that strong in the area of independent management consulting, although many, uh, consulting firms have uh, had their roots in the United States. If I were to turn to Europe, I would say that Europe is big, and I'm talking about Western Europe, not as much about the CEE, but in Western Europe, what we know is that they're very strong in marketing kinds of activities, and they're also very strong in interim management. Now, why are they strong in interim management? And the answer is because the, the cost of hiring and making a mistake in Europe is a much greater cost than it is in the United States where people are working so-called at will. You can move somebody out if they're not doing the job in the United States fairly easily. It's not very expensive. Whereas in Europe, it may cost a year or two years of salary to move that person out. So organizations have been more careful by hiring more interims. And I wrote a nice article about that recently. Uh, in Africa, we're seeing some interesting work done in independent management consulting we're also seeing a lot of ecos ecosystem services, for example, uh, providing uh, funding to startups, uh, for example, providing benefits to freelancers. It's just beginning in Africa, but it's a nice thing that we are seeing. And we are seeing that some of the communities within Africa, like South Africa, are in fact quite mature, quite sophisticated, et cetera. If you were to turn to LATAM, LATAM is strong in the, in three areas, independent management consulting, creative services, and the third, of course, is, is the tech. And we're seeing a lot more uh, LATAM uh, freelancers moving into the United States, but working uh, remotely for US uh, clients. And then if you think about Asia, boy, what a, what a growth we're seeing across Asia in all of those dimensions. So, UK is, is the one thing that I didn't mention, and, uh, and of course the UK is important to many of us. UK is very strong in, in the area of creatives. It's very strong in the area of management consulting, and it's strong, of course, in technology. So we're, we're seeing a, a very interesting mix all over the, the world. Things are happening at different rates of speed, but what we can say is that across the board, there's increased interest in freelancing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this insight. I mean, I, I believe you you do brief the, the freelance revolution 24-7. <laughs> it's a scary thought. It's a scary, it's a scary thought. You know, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, let me interrupt and I'll, I'll tell you a story. And, and, and the question is how I got involved in this stuff. 
So I, I, I worked for, a cons- I was a partner in a consulting firm. We were HR and strategy consultants, and it was a lot of fun. And and we did a nice job. We took two companies uh, to the public markets. We listed two companies. And I thought I was going to retire. I was doing a last project for a company called McKesson. McKesson is a very large global pharmaceuticals company. And, uh, and the president of McKesson and the head of marketing and HR said, can you take a look, walk around the organization for a couple of months and tell us what you're learning? Tell us... Uh, how we are doing as an organization and where we might uh, find some ways to improve. And uh, and I came back in a month or so and said, you know, the most interesting thing as we look at your age, human capital is that 30% of the people working in this company are not employees, they're freelancers, and you don't know them. You don't know about them. You haven't been involved in bringing them on board because they're brought on board by the middle or lower levels of the organization. And what an interesting thing that your senior managers don't know a third of your workforce. We are seeing that replayed in so many different parts of the world in so many companies uh, that it seemed to me that it was a good thing to begin writing about this stuff. And we were seeing some very simple things like you know, are you a million dollar freelancer? You know, not too many people are making a million dollars as a freelancer, but those were the kinds of, of topics that caught the attention of the, 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 the of, of people. I took a different route, which is to start to tell stories about what was happening in freelancing generally. That for me, the most interesting story wasn't the guy that made a million dollars. It was people like you and Gregor who were building organizations that created millions of dollars in revenue for many people, as opposed to just one. That's very exciting. And what we see now from these small beginnings is we're we're looking at somewhere around 800 to 1,000 of these platforms currently operating. We're looking at 100 to 200 of these platforms currently in beta, just getting started. We're looking at about two and a half trillion dollars in GDP generating worldwide by freelancers. This is a very interesting time, as I said. And and it's only going to continue because, of course, if you think about it, Casper and and Gregor, why why would you want to own all of your resources and be limited in that way if you could rent? And it's no different than choosing to lease a car versus own a car. If I buy a car, I'm with that car for five years. It's going to take me five years to make it worth my time to have bought it. I can lease it and get on the car and get on the road tomorrow. And you can do the same thing with freelancers. I don't mean to suggest that they're chattel, but I mean to suggest that you can very quickly identify the resources that you need, work with a platform like Redigate to get those resources versus spending three, four, five, six months trying to recruit the perfect person. Mm -hmm. The cost of finding that perfect person is probably greater than hiring the freelancers that would have gotten the job done before you even hired that person. Yeah. Think about that. I I guess that's, that's, that's the very good conclusion. And, uh, the the customers are looking for this kind of I don't know <laughs> miracle guy which <laughs> which will uh, <laughs> be the best uh, and uh, they want to spend a lot of time uh, time for the research but uh, they don't see that they can really have immediately the the person but uh, coming coming back coming back to this uh, to this topic uh, what is what is the successful free, uh, freelancer or the the best freelancer for for you to help our, our uh, community to understand who, who would be good person in this uh, in this uh, in this business. Uh, who is it? How, how we will describe it? Let's exchange for just one second because I think this will be fun. Do you have a place that you like to go for uh, for snacks when mm-hmm. when you're when you're working? Do they give you good service? Usually yes, yeah. If I if I they, if I go there all, often, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there. That, that's fair. Do they treat you with respect? Yes. Do they get the job done? Yep. Are they open the right number of hours so that it's convenient for you? Mostly. <laughs> Welcome to freelancer world. And the reality is that as a freelancer, as a solopreneur, 
I am no different than the man that owns the bodega or the delicatessen down the street, the food store down the road, the mm -hmm. bookstore down, down the shop. In, mm -hmm. in all cases, we are, we are independent business people. We have the obligation to be good at what we say we are, we are going to do. We have an obligation to deliver what we promise. We have an obligation to continue to sharpen our sword because the half-life of our technology is going to be fast and fast and fast. Mm -hmm. We we have to understand our 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 freelance our um, we have to understand our clients and we have to give them. There's a wonderful expression that you guys will possibly enjoy, and that is, if I. If I show a client that I understand what he wants, he will let me sell him what he needs. So I have an obligation to show the client that I understand their goals, their real goals, and that we can deliver those in an efficient and cost reasonable way. Mm -hmm. And if and if we do those things, Gregor, that's that's what a freelancer does, and it's no different from the freelancer. From the freelancer that does tech, that does marketing services, that does independent consulting, or the individual that wakes up early in the morning to start a bakery and 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 baking his goods at five a.m., they are all the same. It's called business. John, and I already see this quote. I already see this quote after the talk. <laughs> I already see this quote after the talk. You know, this will be the headline. <laughs> Sounds very simple, you know, but. Uh... I think it's not, not at all. No, no, but it's not simple. It's very it's hard. Simple. Exactly, exactly. We know we know it very well because we met uh, a lot of people. We uh, we have uh, in our pro uh, platform a lot of uh, a lot of uh, freelancers, and it's not easy always to uh, connect all of the skills which are necessary for the for the for the professional freelancing because. Uh, it's, you, you mentioned about the sell, selling, yes, yeah? selling point. Uh, not everyone is so open. Not everyone is so uh, custom say, oriented person. Uh, so, so, so next, next question. Maybe, maybe you are able to uh, a bit specify what kind of. Uh, what kind of skills? Because th those people have some careers. Those, those people have some good uh, uh, corporate background <clears throat> and so on. They've been managers and, and really, really, uh, really good uh, skills. But I believe uh, there are some specific skills because uh, uh, we just uh, we we just uh, trying to develop those skills uh, with one of the Polish university. Uh, what what are those skills for for you necessary for the professional consultants? How, how you see it? You know, I, I I really did mean it when I said before, mm. it's 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 being a business owner, okay. and uh, and at the end of the day, whether you're selling creative services, independent management consulting, or or tech, you've got to start with having a relationship with the client. Yeah, you've got to start with a clarity around what it is that you do particularly well, and you've got to express that through your marketing, through your branding, through your relationships. Mm -hmm. The third thing you need to do. And I'm going to take a minute to talk about this. Is you, you you need to like people. I know that sounds like a funny thing to say, but when we ask freelancers where they think they need to improve, what they say is, and and this is quite consistent across the categories. I'm not so good at networking. I'm not so good at asking for the business. I'm not so good at at uh, at, at well, those two. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not so good at, at really, really working the business proposition. What many freelancers say is, you know, I like the work. I don't like selling the work. I don't like the client relationship stuff, but I love doing the work. Delivery. And here's the dilemma. The dilemma is if you if you're not good with clients then you're not going to get the opportunity to do the work that you that you want to do. So this is not the, the, the big message I think perhaps you would like me to reinforce is it's not the platform's job to get you the work. It's the platform's job to provide a flow of opportunity that you must sign up for and demonstrate that you're the best guy for or the best person for. The, the notion that 
freelancers can eat at your table without effort is just not accurate. And the best way to see it is to 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 see that young consult young young freelancers seem to go through a series of three or four stages in their development. And let me describe those because I mm -hmm. think that may help Gregor with some of the stuff that you're talking about. The first year that people, what, what the first year that people are freelancing, they are not happy. They are not good at it. It's a difficult thing. They are frustrated. They used to have real jobs, quote unquote, where somebody would send them the paycheck every two weeks. They had a cafeteria they could go to. They had benefits, et cetera, et cetera. It's not the same thing when you're working for yourself. So the first thing is, is, is that after about a year, the, the world divides. There are people that are good at doing freelancing and continue. And there are people that aren't good at freelancing or don't like it. And they move back into full-time work. Once people have gone through that one year period, it turns out that for the next couple of years, they kind of like what they're doing. They like being freelancers in the next couple of years. But then they hit another speed bump. And the speed bump is not, are they good at it? Because they are good at it after the, the two or three years. It's, do they want to do it for their career? That's a big decision for people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and what you see is a drop in satisfaction during that year when they're trying to figure out whether they want this as their career or whether this is a part-time thing or whether they're moving back to 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 a full-time job. And what we know is that about a third of these folks drop out of freelancing. What we know recently is that some data says as many as 60% would like to get a full-time job if they could find the full-time job that they wanted. But part of that is, but they don't find the part that they wanted. And so they stay in freelancing. That's the problem. So, <laughs> we, so we see some very interesting trends. We see that First year, it's very tough for people, but people who stick with it do very well. Then three years later, they say to themselves, is this my future? Some people say yes, some people say no. The people that say it's my future get excited again, get interested and engaged by what they're doing. And at about the 10 year mark, they ask the question again, is this what I want to do? <laughs> so I think what, what we are seeing more and more is that Freelancing isn't a terminal career in the sense that I'm just going to keep freelancing forever. Freelancing is a path within a career. Your career is as a technical person. Your career is as a consultant. Your career is as, as a marketing services or creative services person. You may choose to, to do that career as a full-time person. You may choose to do that career as a full-time freelancer. And you may choose to do that, that career as a combination of, on the one hand, having a full-time job or a full-time or a, a regular part-time job. And on the other hand, moonlighting uh, or side gigging uh, and doing some, uh, some freelancing on the side. And in fact, what we find is that about 60%, 65% or so of freelancers are in fact doing it part-time. Only about a third of the freelancers globally are full-time freelancers. This so is that, also was the a, trend. that was yeah. a long answer, huh? That was yeah. a lot of information. <laughs> absolutely, I'm yeah. Sorry, but, you guys. but I, 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 I absolutely also need to agree on, on, on the point you just raised. I mean, we also see the trend uh, down here in Poland that there are more and more people um, registering themselves on the platform uh, at Redigate uh, while still working full time, so to say. So they are looking yes. for some yes. specific uh, side gigs, mm -hmm. as we say, to, now to it's maybe. A problem. And here's the problem. Yeah, here's the problem ahead. that comes with it. Mm -hmm. And that is enterprise companies, large corporate companies, don't like side giggers. They don't like part time moonlighters. Yeah. And they don't because they can't count on them, because there may be conflicts. Uh, or for any number of reasons. You, you, big companies want to reduce risk every way they can. They, the last thing they want is risk. And, and so they're not so interested in the side givers and the part-time people. And the part-time people are 65, 70%. So what we must do is increase the, the, the percentage of full-time freelancers in order to serve those big customers. 
if we don't end up serving those big customers, we won't be the industry we could be. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, that's the goal. Yeah. Now, why do people why do people choose not to go into full-time freelancing? And there's there's data on this. There are three things that worry people when they think about going into full-time freelancing. One, they're afraid of income volatility. They're afraid that they'll make a lot of money one month, no money the next month. That's a hard thing to budget. My wife would go crazy if I was making some money one month and not enough money another month because she wants the budget. Second, they they are worried about losing benefits that they like, benefits like, like education, benefits like vacation, benefits like time off, benefits like uh, saving for a pension. These are things that we're not currently doing. We need to begin doing that. And we need to work with ecosystem partners and fintechs and other areas to make sure we're providing some of that over time. And the third thing that causes people to be hesitant about full-time freelancing is a fear of loneliness. Mm -hmm. It's a fear that they're working, they're working in their house. In their in their garret, in their garage, in their in their attic with a computer, and they don't see anybody, and they can't stop. Mm. And those are the three things that worry people. We can help with all of those things. Platforms can help with all of those things. We can help them with education that helps them to know when to put down the computer and go play outside with their children. We can help them to smooth their income. And we can teach them to do a better job of generating income. And finally, we can provide access to some of those benefits. Now, that doesn't mean that Renegade should be paying all that stuff, but we can we can connect them with services that offer them many of those benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to do that. It's going to take some time. Absolutely, absolutely you're right, because we, 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 we noticed this kind of... Uh... Uh, I, I, uh, points, uh, I would say, uh, and uh, absolutely we address this uh, this topics uh, because, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, uh, with with top top university in Poland, Kozminski, uh, we create kind of uh, kind of a full program to uh, to develop the the freelancer from the let's say as well. Uh, Hard, uh, hard, uh, hard skills, soft skills, and those uh, important points which you mentioned before about uh, how to be entrepreneur, how to be uh, successful in the contacts with the with the customer, how to sell yourself. Uh, so we call this model "you at the market." Yes. So those are the points absolutely which uh, which are which we see, which we address, and. Uh, by educating the the people, they will feel more comfortable, more reliable, and then they can they can uh, really uh, build a much successful career in the in the consulting. Absolutely right. You did some. You said something very important that I want to reinforce, and and that is remember the four stages of early success. Right, the first stage is I'm just learning and I'm not doing a very good job, and I don't know whether this is for me. Second stage is ah, I'm good at it. And th those who stay say, I'm good at it, so I'm going to stick around. But then in, in two years, around the five-year mark, they go, but is this what I want to be doing in 20 years? Is this my life? And they go through the process of thinking about that. Some of them say no, and they go back to working. Some of them build companies, and some of them continue to freelance. One of the implications of that, Gregor, which I love what you have just said, is we need to create education that addresses all of those transitions. Most of the education that we're doing is just the first year. It's getting the person to start to feel competent about freelancing, but it's not helping them figure out whether that's their life's work. We have more to do in education than we have done. And I will tell you, you guys are as, as far along as anybody, but nobody is dealing with the, the second dimension of this, which is, what do I do with the experienced freelancer to help them to continue to perform and grow and be successful? So I'm very excited about that. And I'm also very excited about getting a whole bunch of platforms together across CEE, across the EU, across the UK and in the US and elsewhere, 
you know, you shouldn't have to create all the education yourself. I mean, that's nuts. Every single platform is spending hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars building education for their freelancers. Let's let's use our money better. Let's join forces. Let's collaborate so that we're creating it once or twice, but not every time. I know with, with great confidence that the experience of being a Polish freelancer is not so different than the experience of being a, a Czech or a, or a UK freelancer that we need different things. Absolutely. So, so I am very excited about this idea of collaborating across. You know, we got we got a whole bunch of platforms together in the UK and created an association called the Association for the Future of Work. We created we got a whole bunch of platforms together in Spain and they called it re re evolution. Mm -hmm. We've got a whole bunch of platforms together in Latam. I don't know what they're calling it, but they're working together, which is wonderful. I would love to see some of this happening in Eastern Europe. I would love to see European freelancers work together. So, for example, you guys working with the guys at Uplink, working with the guys at Code Control, working with the guys at Expert Powerhouse. I mean, there, there's a wonderful opportunity for us to join forces. That doesn't mean we're not competing. Of course we're competing. But let's compete on the things that matter, not on the things that we can help each other with. Great idea. What 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 else we can take from the U.S. market for? <laughs> That's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly my plan. My plan is it, it, one of the reasons I'm so excited about working with you guys is that if if we can get you excited, we can get others that look to you for for uh, because of your respect, their respect for you. You can be the the uh, the stalking horse that breaks through, that would be a wonderful thing. So I'm very excited about what Redigate can do to get other platforms excited about working together in those areas where we can be, you know, the expression, the rising tide that lifts all boats. We have to do that. And then and then we compete, but we compete on the stuff that matters, not on the stuff that doesn't. We we talked a lot about the freelancers themselves, <laughs> about the experts, how they can develop their skills and um, how they can become better in the in this business. But also, <laughs> this business wouldn't, of course, function wouldn't work without the customers themselves. And uh, sure. as you as you said, as we established at the very beginning of the of the talk today, is that uh, the the customers will be more and more keen. Um, to to hire and to um, involve the freelancers, the external freelancers into their process, into their organizations. But how the companies can pick the perfect one for them? I mean, what are the sele selection criteria that you see based on your experience uh, maybe to help the companies how to get the best one, how to get the one that will fit best? It's a great question. And, 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 and you know, here's what we're learning. That you just... I, I, I'm just finishing up a, a, an article for Forbes on independent management consultancies. And, and one of the data points that I, I thought was, was so interesting is that clients, as client companies, as particularly enterprise companies, uh, get more interested in freelancing and freelancers, they're doing two things. One is they're starting to put budget aside specific to independent management, independent management consultants, as opposed to the McKinsey's and the Bain's and the BCG's, I think that may happen in other areas as well. So they're starting to see the potential. Mm -hmm. But here's the here's the other side of that. Because they're starting to see the potential, they're more and more focused on making sure the curation or the match is the right one. And they're thinking about more skills than historically. So it's not just, do you know React Native or do you know Laravel? It's also, what do you like it to work with? Do you have the language skills that you need? Do you have the experience that you need? Have you worked on this kind of a project before? All of those dimensions. So we're, we're now expected, and I'm sure you guys are experiencing this as well, to have more information about all of our freelancers than we've ever had before. Mm -hmm. To have and to have that information accessible, not just in the in the head of the matcher, 
but now in the computer. This is a very important uh, thing that that uh, will help those guys to make uh, good judgments about, about who goes in and who doesn't. There are two other things that are happening. One thing that's happening is we're seeing a lot more uh, direct supply arrangements. We're seeing a lot more uh, platform, a lot more companies creating what they call talent clouds. What companies want to do is they want to populate these talent clouds with the freelancers that they would like to work with in future. Sometimes those are alumni, sometimes those are your guys or your ladies, but put into their talent cloud so that they have easier access to them. So that is one thing, and that's going to have an impact on freelance platforms. Would you call because it a blended as, as, workforce then, or how would you call it? No, I would. No, I would say something else with that. With that, Casper, I would say that they're trying to ask platforms to give them access to the freelancers that serve them best or that they know best, and the consequence of that is you may be disrupted. Some of those folks may not continue to work on your platform because they're going direct to the talent cloud of a, of a client. So that's one thing you have to be careful about. The second thing that you have to be careful about is that, and, and I know you didn't ask this question, but I think it's relevant to you guys, is that what we're also seeing is a number of organizations are saying, we want to represent not just our freelancers, but we want to represent your freelancers too. Mm -hmm. And uh, and 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 so they're calling it gateways, they're calling it uh, open assembly has a gateway as you call as it calls it uh, 9 a.m. in Germany, uh, Frigg in uh, in the Netherlands. These are organizations that have open systems and are inviting people to uh, to put their freelancers in that platform. So for example, uh, you guys might be participating with 9 a.m. Germany and putting some of your technical people on there. If 9 a.m. gets uh, gets a request, they may go to your freelancers as the best ones you get paid, et cetera. So we are seeing more delivery systems for freelancers. It used to be just you'd go to a platform, you'd, you'd say, this is the kind of skill I need, find the person, et cetera. Now you're seeing uh, talent clouds in companies. You are seeing gateways or aggregators uh, within the, the the community of freelancing. So it's a time of some interesting change. Mm -hmm. When we start to talk about the clients themselves, and I'm so glad you asked that that question. Um, Casper, what we what we know is that under 50% of the of the big corporates, according to the freelancers in surveys, Less than 50% of big corporates really know how to work with freelancers. Less than 50% of corporates uh, are, are described by freelancers as having project managers that know how to work with freelancers. And, and what we're seeing is, is that less than 50% of, of the companies are judged by their, the freelancers that work with them. Uh, to, to be realistic in their expectations of what can be achieved for the price. So interesting time. One of the things that we have to do is not just educate the freelancers. We need to educate the clients mm -hmm. because so many of these clients want to treat freelancers in the same way that they know how to treat employees, but they're not employees. Mm -hmm. When you go to a delicatessen and buy a sandwich, the, the delicatessen doesn't work for you. They're just delivering a sandwich. Freelancers are, aren't, aren't owned by their companies in the way that employees are owned by their companies, if I may put it that bluntly. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are selling a service no different from a sandwich. Mm -hmm. You cannot ask them to work extra long hours. You cannot ask them to work extra time for free. You can't ask them to do something which is outside of the, the contract in the same way that you might ask an employee because you feel as though you have control over that employee, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. So part of the future of work is, 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 is leaving the old notions of how managers and employees relate to one another 
And we are starting to see the potential for not a, a, a colonialist relationship where I'm the boss and you're the, the guy that's got to do what I'm told. So we have an arrangement. I've asked you to do this for this amount of pay. You're going to do that. I want to give you feedback. But then that's it. It's a whole new world and lots of companies are not sure how to do it. We need to teach them how to do it. And we need to protect our freelancers because when they're working for managers that don't know how to do it or companies that don't know how to do it, they may be treated badly. Mm -hmm. And we have an obligation to make sure that, that they're getting the, the, they're working in companies that treat them with respect. Let me dig a little bit deeper into this. Uh, sure. Let's 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 imagine I'm a I'm a I'm an HR manager. I'm a hiring hiring manager at at a big organization, maybe even a, a middle sized one. Um, would you have maybe three tips for me? How could I maybe enable my organization? How can I get better at picking the perfect candidate, or and then also making the the collaboration afterwards successful with him? Yeah, you know, here's the place where I'd start. I ran HR organizations. I'm, I, I know HR, at least I know it historically. I'm an old guy, but I you know, wasn't a million years ago. But nobody ever taught HR how to architect a workforce. Think about that for a minute. Nobody ever taught HR how to build and design a workforce. HR people know how to hire people. HR people know how to fire people. HR people know how to bonus people. HR people know how to pay people but they don't know how to design a workforce. And we are asking our, our clients to think very differently about their workforce. As you pointed out earlier, we are, we are offering a blended and flexible workforce as opposed to a workforce that's neither blended, it's all full-time or flexible because it's all full-time. So we are asking them to create something different and HR people don't know how to start with that. Mm -hmm. Do we Remember, have any golden rules for them? The HR to guy, it was the HR guy that I told that he's got a third of his population <laughs> and he's not involved. Second thing we know is that HR is typically not involved in most of freelancing. Most freelancers are hired by middle level managers. They're hired by the engineering director. They're hired by the, the manager of supply chain. They're hired by those guys. They may get support from procurement, from purchasing, they are rarely involved deeply with HR. HR is in the business of full-time employees. One, one of the things that you will see more and more organizations creating is what they call contingent work managers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're in HR, but mostly they're in procurement. We did a serve, we did a, I was invited to a conference in, in, uh, in, in Copenhagen in March. And, and it was the end of March, and it was called Flexible, Flexible Workforce Summit. There were lots of procurement and purchasing people there. There weren't any HR people there, because HR is not terribly interested in that stuff right now. HR is in the business of full-time employees. And our work tends to be managed by either mid-level managers who are hiring the, the guys in your platform, supported by procurement or purchasing. In general terms, it would be wonderful to get HR more involved, but it's got to get more involved at a strategic level, not at a transactional level. It doesn't need to get involved at a transactional level, but at a strategic level, the question, the question is this. And let me, let me use this in the context of a consulting firm. If you were to go to McKinsey, or if you were to go to Bain, or if you were to go to BCG and say, what percentage of your workforce in three years will be contingent. These are consultants, remember. Mm -hmm. They would say about a third. They would say that, that what we're going to find is 10 to 20% are gone because of chat GBT or other things. Because the reality is, look at what AI is going to do for some of these consultancies, particularly at the junior level, right? Second thing is, is very much that, that these guys recognize that an awful lot of their work needs to be needs needs to be done by people that have expertise way beyond full time people in consulting. And so you've got you've got AI, you've got excuse me consulting, and you've got freelancing. 
And all of those fit together into an architecture for the workforce of a McKinsey, Bain, and BCG. Every, every, every company needs to do that. IBM just announced that about 7,000 jobs will be eliminated because of CHAP GPT. That, that a whole bunch of, of stuff over the next couple of years can just go away because of that tech. Mm -hmm. Every company should be asking, what does our workforce look like in the, in the aftermath of the freelance revolution, the, the remote revolution, and the AI revolution? And if we're not looking at all three of those things as we're building our workforce, we are making a big mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the future. And, Sounds and a bit scary for some of the people. It does, but you know what? I'm, you know, Gregor, I'm 71 and I can't get right. I mean, I am so <laughs> excited about this. I mean, it, to see another revolution in my lifetime is amazing. <laughs> I, I can't say enough about how exciting it is to wake up and see the world has changed moving. once more. Moving yeah. fast. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> if it moves fast, maybe I can move fast too. <laughs> <laughs> John, so soon, very soon, we might we might need to conclude our talk for today. So just just very last question. Uh, since as as you yeah. know, we it's not a secret that we we did talk before um, with each other. Yep. Um, we last time we were the we were nominated to the to the startup of the of the year award uh, granted by Money.pl. Uh, in Poland, uh, we are also developing uh, at the moment Redegate within the C region. I believe we are on a good path, gaining also the trust on the on the customer side, gaining the trust, of course, of the of the freelancers themselves acting as uh, interim managers or consultants. But do you have maybe some some tips or hints uh, based on your experience from the from the US, also from seeing the Western platforms that you could share with us right now here at the end of our podcast today? Uh, what we should bear in mind as the founders of this platform uh, in terms of the further development of it? You know, let me think about that for a minute. It's a wonderful question. Um, I think that if, if, if I were to offer a, a tip, and I don't know whether this will be a good tip, but I know you're going to be involved in this. So let me also tell the audience something that I know about you guys that they might not know. And that is that you're going to be part of the, the what we call the freelancer first study group. It, it's the second study group, but I'm so glad that you're going to be part of it. Very much looking forward. And, yeah. Uh, and and so am I. I mean, so the logic of the, the the logic of the freelancer first study group is that we need to prioritize the success and and satisfaction, success, prosperity, satisfaction of our freelancers. We've got to do more to help them to be successful. That doesn't mean that we're going to get them the jobs because the jobs are things that they get from themselves. But the more that we can do what you guys are doing, which is make sure they're educated, make sure they're connected, make sure that they're part of an active and engaged network so they're learning from each other, make sure that they're, they're what I call hunting in packs. So working together with other freelancers so they're able to attract larger and more important projects. I think that if, if you can do that, and at the same time, you can work with your clients to help them to be better at better, uh, better platforms for the work of the freelancers that you, you make available to them. Freelancer success, client success, that's golden. Mm 